Hello everyone. Hope you are well. So this is a continuation to the previous lecture, and uh, again this is also going to be a collaborative lecture uh, between me and Dr. Ajay. So these are your learning outcomes. So as a continuation from uh, last class, we will be seeing. the remaining part of the lesions that are to be covered uh, during these lectures uh, such as fem figures fem figoid and uh, uh, single axis and uh, bullous lesions just to remember uh, in the last class uh, we saw a few acute lesions and chronic lesions so uh let me just remind you of the classification uh, on which basis we are going about this class so we are basically classifying this ulcerative vesicular bullous uh, disease based on the clinical course of the disease into acute lesions chronic lesions and recurrent lesions in uh, acute we have uh, primary herpetic gingival stomatitis herpes zoster erythema multiforme steven johnson syndrome in chronic we have femficus femficoid bullous femficoid mucous membrane femficoid paraneoplastic femficus um epidermolysis bullosa and uh, in recurrent lesions we have recurrent uh, herpes labialis recurrent uh, intraoral herpes and erythema multiforme and apart from this we also uh, classify them based on hereditary based on their etiology hereditary as uh, epidermolysis bullosa discaratosis discaratosis congenita uh, familial benign uh, chronic femficus uh, darius disease and in infections we have uh, primary herpetic gingival stomatitis uh, recurrent uh, herpes labialis uh, herpes zoster chicken pox serpentina hand foot mouth disease ramsey hand syndrome and uh, we have immune mediated or uh, autoimmune uh, disorders such as erythema multiforme femficus femficoid bullous lichen planus epidermolysis bullosa and uh, other miscellaneous such as uh, oral sub mucous fibrosis uh, allergic stomatitis burns uh, traumatic blisters uh, id reaction and uh, radiation mucositis all of this classification is uh, uh, given at the was given at the end of the uh, uh, last uh, class presentation and it is given in this presentation as well uh, i want you to uh, go through it um, and remember the classification at least uh, uh, withhold or memorize uh, two classifications um, in your uh, memory whichever is whichever you are comfortable with uh, preferably i would like you to learn all the classifications uh, uh, because uh, learning uh, them in order of classification helps you um in terms of remembering the etiology of the uh, condition then based on histopath uh, we can categorize them as intraepithelial subepithelial and both involving both intra and subepithelial um, uh, layers um intraepithelial we have uh, femficus uh, darius disease and uh, subepithelial we have mucous membrane femficoid epidermolysis bullosa traumatic blisters and uh, condition involving both we have uh, erythema multiforme and uh, just uh, based on uh, oral ulcers uh, we can classify them based on mechanism um, local disturbance uh, traumatic ulcers necrotizing xylem ataplasia and uh, based on the mode of onset uh, we have primary which is aphthous traumatic and malignant ulcer and secondary which initially presents as a vesical bullae or nodules uh, herpes zoster femficus and uh, herpetic gingival stomatitis and uh, based on the duration we have uh, acute again uh, for the ulcers we have acute ulcers uh, which is uh, primary herpetic gingival stomatitis varicella zoster herpes zoster herpangina erythema multiforme allergic stomatitis and uh, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis and recurrent ulcers we have recurrent aphthous stomatitis bechet's disease uh, cyclic neutropenia uh, allergic stomatitis erythema multiforme uh, ulcers due to nutritional deficiencies and uh, in chronic ulcers we have traumatic ulcers uh, tuberculous ulcers syphilitic ulcers deep fungal ulcers uh, 
like uh, histoplasmosis and ulcers in HIV, ulcers in uh, ulcerative lichen planus, pemphigus, pemphigoid and malignant ulcers. So this is uh, and uh, based on morphology we have discrete grouped uh, and based on number we have solitary and multiple. Based on number is uh, another it, uh, important classification. Solitary is generally traumatic, malignant, and uh, we have some other uh, um, conditions uh, which presents as solitary ulcers in some cases of uh, tuberculosis and some in some cases of uh, neutropenic ulcers. And in multiple, we have uh, herpetic gingival stomatitis, uh, aphthous stomatitis, herpes zoster, uh, and so on. So remembering them based on their uh, classification is again uh, very important. So let's continue and uh, do the other uh, um, diseases, uh, other vesiclobulous uh, ulcerative diseases. To start off with, we have uh, afterstomatitis. Uh, so the etiology for afterstomatitis is uh, generally unknown. Um, it's uh, uh, it probably represents a focal uh, immuno dysfunction, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes there is a viral or a bacterial agent identified, and sometimes most and most times there is not. That is there is no influence of any infection over these ulcers and uh, this uh, the triggers for these ulcers varies from case to case so the etiology for the cause of these ulcers vary from case to case uh, starting from increased uh, it can be as uh, diverse as something being stress and anxiety hormonal changes dietary factors trauma and sometimes even viral influence so these alterations in uh, barrier uh, permeability um, uh, may be a factor and uh, it can occur as uh, uh, in uh, um, in some cases of HIV and AIDS and uh, bone marrow suppression, um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis or uh, in case of iron or uh, folate deficiency, uh, iron folate, B12, zinc uh, deficiency and in some cases even magnesium deficiencies uh, are, are shown to be uh, causative factors. How it is is because uh, when the patients are treated accordingly with uh, nutritional supplements, uh, micronutrients, magnesium, zinc, uh, page, some patients have shown significant who have otherwise not been able to uh, you know, uh, recover, have shown significant uh, uh, improvement, uh, thus leading to the hypothesis that uh, it could be uh, dietary deficiency and uh, although it is uh, immunology uh, can play a key role uh, the uh, specific mechanism of how uh, immune uh, complexes come into play in uh, after stomatitis is still not very uh, very clear the uh, human uh, leukocyte antigen um, HLA subtype uh, uh, can be a factor in some cases and um, this uh, after stomatitis is almost uh, it almost affects almost over 25 percent of the population and uh, prevalence is uh, approximately 20 percent um, so uh, there is a good chance that in your clinical practice that you might uh, come across uh, an uh, after stomatitis uh, case at uh, any given point um, the presentation for uh, after stomatitis uh, so it is generally a recurrent uh, self-limiting painful ulcer and it is usually restricted to the non keratinized uh, oral and pharyngeal mucosa and uh, um, it is uh, well demarcated ulcers well defined ulcers uh, with uh, with a yellowish base and uh, an erythematous halo so this plays a key, a key uh, clue in uh, most of the uh, ulcers uh, which causes inflammation around them so you might remember uh, from your uh, uh, basic sciences knowledge the signs of inflammation ruger pallor dollar and all that so you can you can significantly see all these uh, signs in most of the uh, cases of these uh, herpetic ulcers traumatic ulcers or after ulcers you can see erythema surrounding the uh, ulcer um, there is pain associated um, 
and sometimes in certain severe cases of uh, ulcer it might be associated with rise in temperature so uh, you can see all the positive signs of inflammation uh, in, in, in uh, after ulcer and uh, this is a very uh, um, you know uh, classic uh, feature that is um, it's a very defined ulcer with an yellow fibrinous base and uh, an erythematous halo and uh, there are three clinical forms uh, one is minor ulcer then major ulcer then herpetiform lesions so the minor variant is uh, the most common uh, subtype and uh, it is occasional uh, it occurs mostly single but uh, often multiple also it is less than one centimeter in diameter um, so the differentiation between minor and major comes here so the occurrence in number and the size of the ulcer is what basically differentiates the minor and major although um, we can conduct or we can try and establish it with histopathology but then like uh, the size of the ulcer is what majorly determines the subtype here um, for a minor being less than one centimeter over and round shape which heals by itself uh, 7 to 14 days and with intervention maybe a little earlier and the major variance which is otherwise called sutton's ulcer uh, is more than one centimeter or greater in diameter and uh, it is it generally occurs uh, uh, single ulcers or sometimes you can only see two or three ulcers in the entire oral cavity whereas in minor it can occur either single or it can mostly occurs like four or five in different uh, areas of the mouth major it is more than one centimeter and uh, it usually occurs as single but you can also see uh, in rare cases you can see uh, multiple also and uh, comparatively the ulcer is much more deeper uh, than that of the minor form and the edges are not as defined as the minor at the ulcer the edges are little uh, ragged and uh, again it has uh, elevated and erythematous uh, margins um, and uh, it may persist for several weeks and even uh, to months uh, when it comes to major uh, aphthys and uh, often it heals with uh, some amount of scarring and uh, moving on to the herpetiform variant uh, which is the least common variant because there is always a good chance that the herpetiform of aphthys ulcer might always get confused with uh, herpes uh, primary herpetic uh, uh, viral infection because the the presentation of both this uh, both of these ulcers are almost similar to the core except that that uh, in her uh, in herpes there is an viral influence whereas here uh, it is herpetiform it is not herpes it, it it appears like an herpetic ulcer but it is not uh, herpes uh, so they are generally a group uh, superficial ulcers which are grouped uh, and which are just one to two millimeter in diameter and they usually present as crops crops means they uh, present as groups so you cannot easily find a single solitary herpetiform ulcer they will usually present as multiple so many uh, in groups sometimes these might coalesce to give an appearance as a large ulcer also and uh, again the number can vary anywhere from 10 to 100 and uh, it is uh, it usually in, uh, uh, it, uh, it occurs in both keratinized and non keratinized tissue and healing again for this herpetiform type of after ulcer also occurs within 7 to 14 days there is no etiologic role for uh, uh, herpes simplex virus like i mentioned before in this and uh, when it comes to recurrent uh, after uh, ulcers it occurs as uh, simple and uh, complex and uh, uh, aphthosis. Uh, the complex aphthosis uh, is usually severe, almost uh, continuous ulcerations, disabling large and severe lesions. Whereas uh, the minor or the simple form is usually uh, smaller in size and uh, there are few lesions and usually minor or hepatiform. So, in uh, AIDS patients, the lesions are typically more severe and uh, occur at any oral surfaces. So, uh, when, uh, when you have an HIV positive AIDS patient, uh, uh, please note HIV positive is uh, different and uh, AIDS is different. Uh, so, they are, uh, you might all very well remember that they are all based on various parameters like the CDE4, CDE8 count and uh, 
patients presenting symptoms so with an in an age patient uh, it can occur in any surfaces so all these uh, rules of uh, keratinized and non keratinized mucosa are off in case of uh, age patients so the diagnosis for this is usually uh, done with uh, clinical appearance and uh, the treatment and everything is purely based essentially on uh, clinical uh, examination and uh, patient history and uh, sometimes uh, uh, there is also a positive family history and uh, in cases it is required in case of a differential diagnosis of something like a femphigus femphigoid or uh, some underlying disease is uh, uh, suspected then you can go for an uh, excisional or incisional biopsy of the lesion uh, differential diagnosis can be uh, depending on the number it can be traumatic ulcer it can be uh, herpes simplex uh, viral infection or it can be femphigus femphigoid or it can be cyclic neutropenia etc Okay, so it's me, Dr. Ajay. Coming to the histopathology of uh, recurrent aphthous ulcers, well, as you know, an ulcer is a break in uh, the continuity of the epithelium. And so, microscopically, what do we see? Right? So, we see a fibroporulent membrane covering the ulcer. You see superficial colonies of microorganisms. We will see intense inflammatory infiltrate, right? Which would, which is something uh, common under the base of the ulcer, necrosis near the surface, and granulation tissue at the base. Okay, a typical Anishko cell is also seen in uh, in the smears done from abscess ulcers. Okay, now this is like a fun fact. Now Anishko cell uh, are basically cells with elongated nuclei containing a linear bar of chromatin. They have radiating process of chromatin extending towards the nuclear membrane and the nuclear chromatin is arranged along the long axis of the nuclei. Now, a fun fact is that this is also seen in sickle cell anemia. This cell is also seen in megaloblastic anemia, uh, in children on chemotherapy and even in normal people. Okay, So, this uh, presentation uh, in smears of uh, smears taken from the buccal mucosa of these patients as well as after ulcer patients present the cells this NH goes and this cell typically looks like this all right treatment for uh, recurrent after stomatitis uh, first uh, we have to uh, look into the symptomatic treatment that is with uh, pain relief uh, with the topical anal anesthetics and analgesics and uh, um, so in most of the cases, in minor and major uh, herpetiform ulcer type, symptomatic uh, therapy alone should be more than uh, adequate. Uh, but if we suspect a systemic cause, like for example, if there is, if you suspect a deficiency or if you suspect stress or uh, anxiety being the triggering factor or any psychological condition being the enabling factor, then that should be addressed as well. Uh, tetracycline based uh, oral rinses uh, have proven to be very uh, helpful in treatment and uh, corticosteroid therapy uh, such as uh, uh, betamethasone, clobetasone uh, which are applied directly uh, over the lesion can reduce the amount of inflammation thus giving uh, patient uh, some amount of uh, relief. Then uh, intralesional corticosteroid injections can also be uh, given. Um, then in short uh, short duration uh, systemic corticosteroids are also prescribed in case in severe cases and uh, other immune modulating drugs can also be helpful uh, such a and uh, um, uh, amyloxenox uh, paste uh, hydrochloroquine uh, tacrolimus and uh, dabzone have also been used in treatment of uh, after ulcer and uh, one more uh, drug that is uh, used is pentoxifilin. Uh, if you remember, uh, this is a drug which is also prescribed in case of uh, oral submucous fibrosis. Um, uh, it's called pentoxifilin therapy. Thalidomide treatment has shown uh, efficiency and, uh, and in uh, some uh, cases, uh, you might have to skip uh, local, that is uh, local application and you might have to go on to systemic uh, corticosteroids and systemic uh, 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 drugs 
immune modulating drugs uh, for treatment in case of very severe case okay so coming to bechet syndrome which is a, a common syndrome which is associated with recurrent, recurrent oral uh, ulceration or recurrent stomatitis it is an immune disre dysregulation okay that means there is a problem with uh, uh, there is an immune defect and it can be after stomatitis can be differentiated from bechet's only by an hla marker okay now hla is human leukocyte antigen and i'm sure you know about it it is related to major histo histocompatibility complex okay the oral lesions in bechet syndrome are very similar to after stomatitis okay so uh, this is a infographic here of the world geographic distribution of bechet's disease now bechet's disease as i told you is an immune dysregulation associated with the hla b5 now it has been noticed that this is very commonly seen uh, or rather frequently seen in east asians and eurasian populations between japan and the middle east and uh, it has been described uh um, this this region is being described as uh, actually the the silk route and because it is seen among this population of people commonly seen among this population of people it is bechet's disease is also uh, called the silk route disease okay um, and uh, hla b5 and hla b w51 is the the cause for the bechet's disease coming to the clinical features it's common among males in the age group of 10 to 45 there is a triad of oral and genital ulceration ocular lesions and skin lesions commonly seen uh, these oral ulcers are painful and are very similar to the recurrent after stomatitis genital ulcers are commonly seen on the scrotum or the root of the penis or the labia majora okay. this is a picture of a patient came in with abscess stomatitis uh, recurrent abscess stomatitis that was eventually diagnosed as bechet's disease based on uh, the triad of clinical presentation as well as the hla hla marker study okay the ocular lesion range from conjunctivitis to uveitis and finally hypopion now hypopion is actually the collection of pus in the anterior chamber of the eye skin lesions could be pustules or papules you very well know what they are other manifestations that are seen in these patients are pyoderma erythema nodosum and erythema multiforme complications that have been noted in these patients are arthralgia thrombophlebitis uh, cns and cvs and respiratory involvement this is a picture here of uh, of a patient who was diagnosed with bechet's we showing the ocular symptom of conjunctivitis and this is hypopion if you can notice this is pus that is collected in the anterior chamber of the eye the severe redness of uh, the, the sclera as well as uh, ocular uh, ulceration noticed over here histopathologically again uh, oral lesions are non shows a non specific ulcer typically uh, an additional feature that is seen histopathologically is vasculitis that means inflammation around uh, the blood vessels the lab diagnosis is uh, when done shows hypergamma globulinemia increased esr leukocytosis and eosinophilia treatment here is symptomatic or supportive in measure Reiter syndrome or reactive arthritis is another uh, syndrome that is associated with recurrent after stomatitis the etiology is unknown it is an immune dysregulation seen in hiv positive patients as well clinical features include uh, commonly seen in 20 to 30 year old males a male to female ratio is minus to 1 the features that are characteristic of reiter syndrome is the patient show has non conococcal urethritis arthritis conjunctivitis and mucocutaneous lesions okay uh, something typically seen in uh, patients with reactive arthritis 
or Rita syndrome is keratoderma glenorrhagica, which is actually a vesiculopapular lesion on the foot of the patient. Now, these are very waxy and uh, are peeled off by um, peel off easily from the patient. Okay. Generally, the prognosis for raptus is very good. Uh, and uh, there is good chance of recurrence but provided if we take care of the condition uh, there should not be any moving on to Bechet syndrome uh, etiology for uh, Bechet syndrome is it's a multi-systemic uh, disease uh, it is secondary to immune dysfunction and it's associated with uh, the HLA subtypes and uh, the one uh, the subtypes involved are uh, HLA BW51 and HLA B12 and uh, and uh, the HLA BW51 is the one uh, cluster uh, in those uh, which are which affects which are most commonly seen in the Middle Eastern and Northern Asian uh, uh, population uh, whereas the other one is mostly seen in the European and uh, American uh, uh, people. Uh, the clinical presentation for Bechet's disease is generally um, the classic signs noted are in oral cavity, eye, and uh, genitalia. Uh, painful, sometimes debilitating oral and genital aphthous ulcers. Uh, ocular lesions can be painful conjunctivitis, uveitis, um, uh, iritis, uh, retinitis, and uh, hypopyron. So, at this point, uh, I hope. Uh, you all remember the anatomy of the eye uh, from your first year so we have the outermost uh, transparent uh, covering and we have the conjunctiva that is attached to the cornea uh, which is uh, generally which is the area we where we look for uh, symptoms for jaundice uh, and uh, others uh, which is the conjunctiva so there is inflammation of the conjunctiva then there is iris which is the centric portion of the um, eye uh, where you have the opening where the vision is per, uh, passes through you have iritis your retinitis which is the uh, receiving area which consists of uh, cones and rods which helps you translate the image that you see to your brain uh, retina uh, there may be inflammation of uh, retina retinitis uh, so apart from this there may there might also be cutaneous signs um, such as uh, erythema nodosum like lesions um, you can have acne form uh, eruptions and you might have uh, pustular uh, eruptions also associated with it in Bechet's disease uh, you will have a positive pathology uh, sign which is very characteristic of uh, Bechet's disease and uh, uh, the idea is when a, a sterile pustule at a site of uh, sterile intradermal saline injections 48 hours you inject uh, subdermally uh, like intradermally mm, uh, a small uh, quantity of saline you will start seeing a, a very sterile pustule in that area other symptoms usually are secondary to uh, vasculitis and uh, a central nervous system can uh, get involved uh, which can cause headache um, uh, you know paralysis and sometimes uh, uh, encephalitis type of problem and uh, gastrointestinal problems like diarrhea inflammatory bowel disease and the patient might uh, in advanced cases might have vascular thrombosis uh, hematologic and other organ system uh, manifestations so like i said the diagnosis is done with uh, uh, pathology test can be conducted and uh, also um, other uh, clinical and uh, history, history signs can lead to diagnosis of Bechet's disease. Differential diagnosis is usually erythema multiforme and Reiter's syndrome, Crohn's disease, mucous membrane femphigoid and treatment is with, generally with systemic corticosteroids because Bechet's disease sometimes mostly is identified at its most severe form and by the time it might be a little late for us to treat it with uh, topical uh, corticosteroids so we generally go with systemic corticosteroids and sometimes with immunosuppressive drugs such as interferon and uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors uh, azathioprine cyclos uh, cycloporine 
chloramphucil, uh, methotrexate, and thalidomide, dapsone, and colchane are other drugs that are used in treatment of Betch's disease. Prognosis is uh, fair um, generally because the disease is very chronic and uh, uh, what we can at the best do is manage the disease to the best possible. Going on to chronic multiple lesions, we have uh, femfigus. So we have already discussed a little uh, about femfigus if I'm not mistaken, but we'll go uh, a little much in depth again on uh, femfigus. Um, starting on with the etiology, it's an autoimmune disease where uh, antibodies are directed towards the uh, desmosome related uh, protein uh, desmoglein 3 or desmoglein 1. It's a drug induced form that exists uh, with uh, uh, you know very less specificity in terms of um, immunologic features, clinical presentation, histopathology. So, uh, generally, the clinical presentation of uh, femfigus is uh, it uh, occurs in over 50% of cases uh, in femfigus uh, develop uh, oral lesions. Uh, the variants we all know the subtypes, the vulgaris, vegetans foliasis, erythematosis, paroneoplastic femfigus and drug related uh, femfigus and in most of the 50% cases we see oral lesions and uh, oral lesions develop in 70% uh, of cases in terms of femfigus vulgaris. It's a painful shallow uh, irregular ulcer with uh, um, friable adjacent mucosa and uh, because these uh, disease tend to rupture and form an uh, ulcer, uh, most common in non keratinous uh, sites and uh, such as the uh, buccal mucosa floor and ventral part of the tongue and often are, uh, often are the basic or the initial sites which are affected uh, by the disease and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes uh, force in on the uninvolved mucosa and skin can uh, lead to uh, new uh, you know new lesions uh, which we call the Nikolsky site so apparently when pressure is upper, uh, applied to a normal area that results in formation of a new lesion which is called the Nikolsky site is very classic of uh, uh, femfigus uh, vulgaris and uh, scopically uh, what we tend to find is that uh, there is a separation or clifting of the sub basal form of basal layer epithelium and uh, vesicle forms at uh, the site of uh, epithelial split and if you do a direct immunofluorescence examination it is positive in all cases and uh, in uh, IgG localization of uh, intracellular space of epithelium there is uh, IgA localization in intracellular space in 30% of the cases indirect immunofluorescence examination is positive in 80% of cases so what is to be understood is that uh, uh, immunofluorescence test uh, uh, exam uh, direct or indirect plays a very key role in terms of uh, diagnosis of uh, uh, femfigus uh, related lesions where you see in uh, direct <coughs> uh, it is positive in almost all cases in terms of uh, femfigus vulgaris and indirect is positive in almost 80 percent of the cases diagnosis is generally carried out uh, with on the basis of patient history uh, clinical examination clinical appearance uh, the manifestations in the mucosa are direct and indirect uh, immunofluorescence uh, differential diagnosis can be mucous membrane femfigoid erythema multiforme erosy lichen planus um, and uh, paraneoplastic uh, femfigus and sometimes even drug reactions Okay, so coming to investigations in this case, uh, case patients who come with suspected photofemficus. So the first investigation that we can do, a chair site investigation that we can do, is called the Zank test or the Zank smear, uh, which is basically uh, rupturing an intact vesicle or a bullet, collecting the fluid, and making a smear just like we make uh, an oral smear uh, to look for Zank cells. Now Zank cells are basically degenerating. Uh, epithelial cells uh, which were uh, of, of great significance in the diagnosis of femfigus um, before the advent of immunofluorescence testing all right so anyway that's the first test the second test is the pathology of the biopsy specimen that means the clinical picture that you've seen in the previous slide um, once you see the lesion you actually do the biopsy the biopsy here in this case is done from perilesional normal tissue 
okay we do not take the center of the uh, of the recycle or the ulcerated area but the perinational tissue and third investigation is direct immunofluorescence which helps us to come up with the confirmatory diagnosis right so when you do the histopathology all right so let's imagine that uh, this is the uh, the clinical picture here right so we have these the, the ulcerated area that is the ruptured recycle and the fungi and you will take the biopsy from the normal perilational tissue and once we take that biopsy histopathologically how does that look it looks like this clearly what you can see is something that is called intraepithelial recycle formation that is there is a split above the basal cells so this is the basal cells you see this white area this is the split it's called the supravascular split okay and then we see a calcitosis that is increasing pickle cell layer and in the split that is the supravascular uh, split we see floating degenerating epithelial cells which are called bank cells i already explained to you that these was a confirmatory the presence of these cells on a zank smear were considered to be uh, important diagnosis for pemphigus right this is the hyper view of uh, histopathology of pemphigus these are the basal cells this is the supravascular split these floating uh, cells that we see here around in the in the in the split are the zank cells or degenerating epithelial cells the confirmatory diagnostic test for pemphigus is immunofluorescence okay so immunofluorescence i will explain what it is so there are two types direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence so direct immunofluorescence please remember is done on tissue biopsies okay so that means they have to be done only on tissue biopsies whereas indirect immunofluorescence is done on specimen that is blood specimens that are collected from patient okay so that is the biggest difference the rest of it you will understand so fluorescence is the emission of light of one color while a substance is irradiated irradiated with the light of a different color okay so in direct immunofluorescence conjugated anti sera is directly added to the tissue section that is the tissue that the biopsy that we have done so here in this case it's frozen tissue section and we add conjugated anti sera onto that and then visualize it under uh, immunofluorescent uh, light okay under fluorescent light indirect immunofluorescence on the other hand other hand is employed to detect antibodies in serum or other body fluids okay so anti human globulin fluorescent conjugate is employed to detect any antigen antibody reaction so if you notice antigen antibody reaction is what is identified in an indirect immunofluorescence whereas direct immunofluorescence what we actually identify is the conjugated anti sera that binds to the antigen so this is the uh, infographic to explain indirect and direct so if you see in the direct immunofluorescence uh, you have the antigen and then uh, the primary antibody with the fluorophore is added on to it it binds to the antigen and then this is detected through the fluorescent microscope because of the fluor fluorophore that is that, that uh, is uh, visualized whereas on the in in the indirect immunofluorescence uh, there's a tissue slide which contains the antigen and the antibody reaction already to which the serum or the, the blood serum or body fluid is attached which is conjugated with the uh, fluorophore so the secondary antibody with the fluorophore which binds to this antigen antibody reaction that is visualized that is indirect uh, immunofluorescence so again i would like to repeat direct immunofluorescence you is done on tissue indirect immunofluorescence is done so once uh, the the uh, the fluorophores bind to the antigen antibody reaction the, the tissue is visualized under fluorescent microscope and then you can see the deposition of igg and oblique or the c3 complement 3 in the intercellular spaces of the epithelium okay which is the area for desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3 so basically this is uh, how it looks like it looks like a fish scale appearance or a chicken wire appearance 
under fluorescent microscope. So here is a comparison between the histopathology and the direct immunofluorescence of Pemphigus vulgaris. If you look here, I'll go through again. You see the supra-basilar split. You're seeing the zinc cells uh, on the direct immunofluorescence. However, you are seeing the uh, the IgG and the complement 3 uh, expression through the fluoropore identification, which uh, the, the pattern of arrangement is chicken wire arrangement or fish scale arrangement. Thank you. The treatment uh, for uh, femfigus or uh, st you start with sy systemic immunosuppressive drugs, corticosteroids, prednisone, asathioprine, uh, cyclophosphamide or drugs used in treatment of femfigus vulgaris and uh, plasma pheresis uh, with immunosuppression is a uh, combination therapy that is usually prescribed for uh, femfigus and uh, prognosis is generally uh, fair um, approximately there is a 5% uh, mortality rate uh, secondary to uh, long term systemic corticosteroid uh, uh, complications so uh, generally fair but uh, patients have uh, 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 tend to show a very good uh, recovery with uh, in terms of uh, figus vulgaris